So tonight we're going to talk about some couple fractures, including the um, scaphoid. And um, what you will find is that we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the scaphoid bone, and we tend to focus a lot on that, and we may miss other injuries, uh, like this patient who came after a fall on outstretched hand with pain in the wrist, and they took x-rays very focused on the scaphoid. You can see on the periphery of the radiograph that he had a displaced fracture of the tracheotum, and if you take uh, proper radiographs, uh, you'll see that very clearly. But if you just look at the scaphoid, you may miss these injuries. Uh, fractures of the body of the traquitum um, are not too rare and uh, often happen, like in this case, when a patient fell onto the ulnar side of the wrist, the whole weight of the body is transmitted from the forearm to the carpus going down, PC form hits the ground and shears the, the, tra the traquitum in this shape, which um, can be a problem. This is another uh, case of a fracture of the traquitum. You can see that the traquitum is split in two, but also you can see that there is a gap between hamate and capitate, and um, also there is a bit of a gap between the third and the fourth metacarpals, and this is, a, this is an axial dislocation. Uh, so when you find a fracture, a carpal fracture, uh, don't congratulate yourself too much. Just uh, look and see what else is there and you'll find more pathology often. This one had an MRI scan and you can see the damage and the displacement in the traquitum, but also the diastasis between hamate, capitate, and between the third and fourth metacarpals. And that was treated with fixation of the traquitum a temporary screw to compress the hamate to the capitate while the ligaments heal and repair of the ligaments. And she did very well following that. Fractures of traquitum are often associated to dislocations at the perilunate or axial. The traquitum is, is very well vascularized and the fractures usually heal well if you treat them well. If they are undisplaced, fractures of the body, you can treat them conservatively, but they are displaced, they often need reduction and fixation. Uh, the other group of fractures of the traquitum that you will uh, see are these ones with the uh, little fragment on the dorsum of the wrist. And sometimes people think that comes from the lunate, but nearly always it comes from the traquitum. And, and they are called avulsion fracture. We know that the dorsal radio traquital ligament inserts around there and is people think this is an avulsion fracture but if you think of it most patients with this pathology they come after a fall on the outstretched hand to get an avulsion you'd have to uh, need a mechanism of hyperflexion and this is not the, the history of the patient gives uh, so these fractures are more likely because by a compression of the ulnar styloid on the traquitum. So it's a chip of the dorsal region of the traquitum, assumed to be an avulsion, but probably the impaction from the ulnar styloid may represent the ligament detachment sometimes. And they do normally settle with conservative treatment, although they not always unite, and occasionally can result in continuous discomfort and then the thing to do is excise the little bit of bone and repair the ligament onto the bone. And if you take some oblique views, you'll see exactly where it comes. And if you look at the bottom left, you can imagine that if you extend completely that wrist, uh, that's where the only stylus is going to hit it, particularly with the forearm in supination. So in general, for carpal fractures, you can have a direct mechanism. Uh, for example, uh, one of my patients with a carpal fracture was hit with an axe by his neighbor and that split the proximal row. That's a direct mechanism, but that is unusual. The more common way is an indirect force when people fall on outstretched hand or they get projected from a vehicle, motorbike or a car with high energy. You can get the shear force like in some fractures of the capitate, and we look at those, or ligament avulsions. 
And this is uh, uh, some work by Mar Garcia Elias. You know him well. Um, some of the slides that are presented today are from his collection. And this is uh, yeah, quite an old study, and he has published several studies on the incidence of carpal fractures. And you can see that uh, out of over 10,000 wrist injuries, 2.4% uh, were carpal fractures. So they are, they are uncommon. Uh, but I wouldn't say that they are so rare as people think. Out of the carpal fractures, two thirds of them are of the scaphoid. Uh, the next one in frequency, the triquitum, but that's because of the little dorsal chip fractures. Uh, trapezium fractures uh, um, are seen, and the ones decrease in frequency. Uh, Pisiform fractures are rare and underdiagnosed. The same with capitate and hamate fractures that are often part of a carpal metacarpal joint fracture dislocation. Fractures of the lunate, two fractures are quite rare, and fractures of the trapezoid are considered to be very rare, but I will question that today. So the tra trapezium um, uh, means a polygon with four sides, and my understanding of it is that two of the sides are parallel and two of them are not. But the problem with that is that trapezium means different things in different languages, and it means different things in British English and in American English. So it gets a bit confusing, but basically the name of polygon. Fractures of the trapezium are about 6% of couple fractures, and most of them are vertical transarticular. So this is an interesting paper. If you want to read a bit more about the trapezium and the by Humes et al. 2004, and the senior uh, author of this paper is Jonathan Compson, um, who has done the bit on fracture of, of uh, anatomy of the scaphoid. He's also done a lot of work on anatomy of the trapezium. And there are five different uh, patterns of trapezium fractures. The commonest one, as we said, is vertical transarticular. Then you can have horizontal fractures that are quite rare, fractures of the dorsal radial tuberosity, the anterior middle ridge, or occasionally you can have very comminuted fractures. So the usual mechanism is axial loading. The thumb is pushed uh, proximal, and you have a force that goes down, uh, often with a Bennett type fracture at the base of the metacarpal and a vertical fracture of the um, trapezium in like that. This is in, in, a, in a young man, uh, skeletally immature. You can see the vertical fracture of the trapezium. Uh, you can see also a salta harris too of the base of the metacarpal. And I put that just to remind you that whenever you see one of these fractures, uh, have a very good look at all the other bones. Um, because they may uh, need treatment too, which wasn't the case in this one. This was internally fixed and the patient did very well. Uh, commonly, these fractures uh, can be treated as part of the Bennett's fracture dislocation. And if you treat the dislocation, the fracture falls in place reasonably well. And sometimes you don't have to do anything about it. If they come late or you have to reduce them open, uh, the best approach is probably the one uh, popularized by uh, Wagner. And that's uh, an incision where the skin changes from dorsal skin to palmar skin. And you can raise the uh, thinner muscles from the CMC joint. And that gives you very good access to both the uh, trapezium and the base of the metacarpal. Just think that about associated injuries. So there was somebody referred to me with a fracture of the trapezium that you can see on that CT, but he also had a fracture of the scaphoid and a dislocation of the metacarpal. So you need to treat them all. Fractures of the ridge of the trapezium, I don't think they are rare. And the ridge of the trapezium is in the fallen medial aspect of the trapezium, provides the insertion from the flexor retinaculum or transverse carpal ligament of the carpal tunnel. And uh, what tends to happen is that people fall on, on the outstretched hand, the arch flattens, and it pulls the uh, insertion, which is the reach of the trapezium. 
Uh, the ritual trepidation, if you are a surgeon, you may uh, recognize as that bit that's difficult to get out when you do trapeziectomy. It is always that last bit that is, is called ligament, very attached and is resisting. So that, that's the one. And, and it is true, it's very, it's very well attached. And you can see a CT scan there with a fracture of the bridge that's not displaced. And, <clears throat> excuse me, often these fractures don't need treatment but need um, recognition. And if you think you've never seen one of those, um, what you need to do is have a look at CT scans that you do for a possible scaphoid fracture. And it doesn't show a scaphoid fracture. Have a good look at the uh, trepidation and you'll see there that they have got a fracture. It doesn't really need treatment other than conservative with the splint for three to four weeks for it to settle. But if you can see it and tell the patient that takes the anxiety away and the worry that you may be missing a scaphoid fracture. Also remember that you can have these in the more severe injuries like axial fracture dislocation where the hand is split and the uh, transverse uh, retinaculum pulls the bridge of the trapezium with the bones of the ulnar side of the hand. So things to remember from fracture of the trapezium, they are commonly associated to the bones, always have a good look at the metacarpal and the distal radius. And if people give you just a radiograph of the thumb, uh, make sure you get the radiograph of the wrist. Most of them are caused by a vertical shear force and there are five patterns. And remember to look for the fracture of the anterior middle ridge and you will find some. Trapezoid, uh, a trapezoid is a polygon with four sides and none of them are parallel in my definition, but that's not, that's not everybody's definition, so don't quote me on that. And they are considered to be very rare, 0.4% of all couple fractures. Uh, I don't think they are that rare. What happens is that they're difficult to see. For example, if I tell you here that there is a fracture of the, of the trapezoid, even when you have two views, you have trouble seeing it. And that's because uh, are, uh, the trapezoid is, is overimposed in both the, the PA view and the lateral, and it's difficult to pick up what's, what's going on in there. And you often need a CT scan to, to detect it. Uh, this is a case of a fracture of the trapezoid, and that's part of a first axis and uh, dislocation. Um, this was a young man, 19 year old, in a car traffic accident, road traffic accident. And Knuckle Kane and me, we published uh, 11 cases of isolated trapezoid fractures from the Bullet Up Hand Center in Derby. So if you look for them, you will find them. If they are displaced, they need uh, treatment, like this one was internally fixed. And we also stabilized the metacarpal while it held with a good outcome. Uh, capitate. Capitate comes from head or the headstone. Is the, the headstone is the one in the middle of the arch, is the one that, that gives that gives a stability. And they are about 2% of the carpal fractures. Half of them practically are through the waist of the capitate, but there are several types. Um, there are one that's a fracture of the proximal pole of the capitate, which uh, behaves a little bit like the proximal pole of the scaphoid. Uh, transverse in the body, vertical, coronal, or in the sagittal plane. And that again is another classification by Marg at CLS when he was looking at all this. And the problem with the capitate is that you see the radiographs, you know something is going on, but you don't know exactly what. And it just looks a bit messy. So this is a radiograph and I got the CT scan on the same day. And if you look at the CT scan, you see that the uh, capitate is split in two, and this is a very significant injury. Uh, often the CT scan looks much worse than the radiograph, or they can be caused by, by axial force. Um, you get it in motorcyclists uh, holding uh, the handlebar and hitting something with all the force is transmitted, and there is a shear force. Uh, with in extension and axial, axial compression. And that uh, tends to produce an injury, sometimes difficult to appreciate there, but if you get the CT scan, you see exactly what's happened and you see the dorsal uh, distal part. So this is quite an unstable injury. 
and sometimes also associated with fractures of the other bones on the distal row. Uh, this is a fracture of the scaphoid, and uh, whenever you see a fracture of the scaphoid that very obvious, look for something else, because um, the scaphoid is in such a tight space that it will be always very well reduced unless there's something going on. If you look at the capitate here, it's difficult to decide if there is something going on in the proximal pole. However, if you get the CT scan, you can see uh, here, see if I can uh, show you this. Uh, so that's the body of the capitate, and this is the proximal pole that's been broken and moved move towards Vola. Then there is the fracture of the scaphoid, and then there is also a fracture of the radial styloid. So I have a very low threshold for um, getting a CT scan in this in this situation. And then uh, if you need to uh, do an internal fixation, uh, just fix everything, uh, the proximal pole of the capitate, the scaphoid, and, and the radius in this case. Uh, this is another uh, scaphoid fraction that you see is quite obvious, so you should have a high index of suspicion. Uh, what you can see is that the capitate is not aligned in the lunate, yeah? So we say that the saucer needs to sit in the cup and is not, and there is something in here. There is a fragment there that's difficult to make out what it is, which is the fragment there, yeah? And this is a, a fracture of the proximal pole of the a capitate, and how that happens is a hyperextension of the wrist where there is a fracture of the scaphoid, there is a fracture of the capitate, the wrist goes all the way dorsal, and then as it recoils, it hits the small fragment and it tilts over. And of course, this is never going to heal, partly because it has no vascularity, partly because it's facing the wrong way. And this one was not diagnosed even when the scaphoid was operated, was you not know, diagnosed uh, and ended up in a, in a chronic problem. So if you see that there is reduced length, so you can see that the thermetacarpal looks a bit more proximal than it should, and there is overlapping of the carpal metacarpal surfaces, you should suspect that there is something significant. And the problem with these uh, proximal pole fractures, as the problem with the proximal pole of the scaphoid is a vascular necrosis, and you can confirm that. And then these cases are difficult to treat. And uh, this was one that developed a vascular necrosis, was treated with a bone graft and a fixation with K wires, and uh, actually healed nicely. Next one is the, is the hamate. A uh, hamate means hooked. Uh, because this bone has got a hook that's characteristic towards the polar side that provides insertion to several structures and is considered to be well, about 1.6% of total carpal fractures. Uh, and there are basically two groups, uh, fractures of the body of the hamate and fractures of the hook of the hamate. Uh, fractures of the body are often part of a carpal metacarpal injury and sometimes associated with a dislocation or a subluxation of the carpal metacarpal joint that's taken out of the dorsum of the hamate. And you're all familiar with these ones. The problem with these ones is that these are the standard views that uh, they give you when somebody is coming to a &E, accident and emergency. And you may see that here, there may be something happens between these two metacarpals, but it's very difficult to say. I mean, I cannot see a fracture there. I cannot see a fracture there. But what I know is that the heads of the metacarpal here make a, a nice smooth arch, and these two seem shorter than they should be. Yeah, So that's a good radiological sign of a significant axial injury. So that means that those two metacarpals had gone proximal, so something bad is happening at the base. And if you get a true lateral, you'll see that there's a dorsal subluxation of the fourth and fifth metacarpals. And if you get the CT, you'll see that there is a, a significant comminuted fracture. Now, many of those uh, can be treated just with um, manipulation, reduction, and K wires. Occasionally, you need to open them dorsally uh, 
And here, the structure at risk is the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve. You have to be very careful with that because it can get very painful. The other group of fractures of the hamate are fractures of the hook of the hamate. And uh, he, one of the things that uh, is well known is that they're associated to racket sports or stick sports. And his typical history is in a golfer that's uh, taken a big swing to the ball and it's hit the ground. So at that point, what happens is that the whole force is transmitted through the club, through the handle, to the ulnar side of the hand and can cause a fracture of the hook of the hammock. It also happens in uh, baseball players and in players of squash, particularly when they miss and hit the wall and the whole energy of the blow goes into the hand. So the hook of the hammock, uh, you remember, is joined to the um, pisiform through the uh, pisohamid uh, ligament, and that's pulled by the FCU, flexor carpi ulnaris, and that's also another type of injury that can happen when uh, that complex together with the fifth ray is, is pulled off, and that's quite an unstable injury, and you will see a fracture of the hook there as well. What does the hook of the hammock do? It's a pulley. And it's a pulley mainly for the long flexors to the little and ring fingers. And it works harder in, with the wrist in um, all the deviation, which is the position when you are playing tennis or a squash or baseball or swinging a golf club. And that gives us a, a clinical test, which is that if you um, ask the patient to place the wrist in ulnar deviation and flex the little finger against resistance, the flexor tendons will push towards the hook of the hammock and there is a fresh fracture or a non-union that may uh, give them pain exactly there and the patient will point to the hook of the hammock. So that should alert you to it. And uh, they often go into non-union. Uh, it is recommended that you take some extra radiological views when you uh, investigate these fractures because in a PA and a lateral of the wrist, you won't see it. And you can get a carpal tunnel view where you hyperextend or extend the wrist and take a tangential X-ray. I find that that doesn't work very well for me, uh, partly because it's quite painful for a patient, particularly a patient with uh, an acute fracture. So if I suspect one, I'll get a, a, a CT scan directly. Uh, practice of the Pisiform, I think uh, they are more common than we think, and they are caused by a fall on our stretch hand usually. They're 2.4% of total carpal fractures. Uh, Clinically easy to find because the pisiform is quite tender. You can grab the pisiform and move it side to side and the patient will find that quite, quite uh, painful. If you uh, remember, there are lots of insertions in the pisiform, including the uh, flexor carpal nariz, the flexor retinaculum, the PC hematum ligament we're talking about, PC metacarpal ligament, the muscles of the hypothenar eminence insert there, as well as the extensor retinaculum. Uh, so it's under a lot of tension and movement will cause pain. Also, there is another type where it breaks transversely, and that's a fall when at the same time the flexor carpal nariz is pulling and a transverse fracture uh, may uh, represent a flexor carpal nariz disruption. So you need to test the function of the flexor carpal nariz if you see this kind of pattern. Uh, so just remember the anatomy, uh, flexor carpal nariz uh, on one side and abductor digiti minimi on the other side. If you have a longitudinal fracture, the pisiform is still encased in the FCU, unlikely to displace anymore, and it will probably heal well. Um, another problem with the pisiform is that if you get a lateral view of the wrist, 
it will be superimposed with the scaphoid, so you won't see it very well. And if you get the posterior anterior view, it will be superimposed with the triquitum, so you won't see it. So the best thing to do is get this, which is a 20 degree supinated view, and you will see the profile of the um, pisotraquitum joint, and you'll know if there is any displacement there that's significant. If there is a step that can develop into pisotraquital arthrosis, and then the treatment for this is excision of the pisiform, and usually the outcome of that is very good. So we will not uh, bother fixing a fracture of the pisiform to start with. We will always treat it conservatively, tell the patient that there is a small chance that this will result in a problem, but if it does, we'll sort it out then by excising the pisiform. Uh, also describe uh, pisotraquitial instability in some cases. And what I've done is, is the same, is excise the, the pisiform and stabilize uh, the ligaments and the soft tissues there nicely. So just remember that these fractures uh, don't, uh, are not easily seen on a posterior anterior or a lateral view, but they are easily seen if you get a 20 degree supinated view of the wrist. So if somebody he comes to you with pain on the volar ulna aspect of the wrist, ask for a supinated view, 20 degrees, as well as the standard PA and lateral as a, as a minimum. Uh, lunate fractures uh, are very rare, I think. I always get excited when somebody calls me and says, oh, I've got somebody with a lunate fracture, and then I get very disappointed. The reason I get disappointed is because what they send me somebody with kind box disease, a vascular necrosis of the lunate, who just got a crack in it. And that, of course, is a completely different situation to a true traumatic fraction. Uh, they can happen, uh, but as I say, very often is, is kind box. So just make sure when somebody sends you one of these fractures, it's not just a pathological fracture through an avascular bone. Of the true fractures of the um, lunate, traumatic, the commonest one is the one from the uh, palmar pole of the lunate, and that's high energy trauma. The ones I've seen are usually motorcyclists, and sometimes they can also have a community fracture. Sometimes they, they, they refer a patient with a possible lunate fracture, which is a small fragment on the dorsum, and nearly always this is not uh, a fracture of the lunate, this comes from the uh, traquitum. And if you take a uh, semi-pronated view on x-rays, you will see exactly where it comes from. So this was a, a motorcyclist with a fracture and compression of the proximal, uh, or the volopole of the, of the lunate. I think these ones uh, deserve to just to try to fix them nicely and they're not easy, and they're probably best fixed through a volar approach through the floor of the carpal tunnel rather than try to fix them dorsally. Remember as well that um, carpal fractures are often associated to other injuries, in particular pedilunate injuries. And this is an example of one of fractures of the carpal bones associated to distal radial fractures, which is the other group. And you, I'm sure you agree that there is a distal radial fracture here. If I reduce that for you, you may have a look and you may see some more fractures there. Uh, so you get one point for seeing a fracture of the on the styloid, another one for seeing a fracture of the scaphoid, another one for seeing the fracture of the capitate, and another one for seeing the fracture of the traquitum. So this is really a greater art injury of the carpus together with a fracture of the distal radius. And the best thing to do is uh, repair everything and reattach the TFCC at once. So the summary of all this is that the carpal bone fractures are rare, but not as rare as we think. You need a high level of suspicion. You need to look for them. It's important to get an early diagnosis, otherwise you may get complications. Uh, if they're undisplaced with a cast for four to six weeks, is more than enough. If they are displaced, 
most of them are intraarticular, so you don't need reduction and stabilization, and the late presentation will need salvage procedures. And that's all I wanted to say for carpal fractures. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and just remind you that the previous uh, talks that are relevant to this, uh, you'll find them on YouTube, uh, Polita videos. Thank you very much.